So it's 3.35. I think we've given folks a fair chance here. So welcome from the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC. Um, we are so excited to be here with you today and to present um, a panel of mental health experts and faith leaders who can help us to think about how we work together to think through strategies to address trauma and promote mental health. The Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC has the goal to promote mental health for all New Yorkers. And many of our strategies seek to reach people where they are and to partner with organizations and individuals that are already trusted by communities. Faith leaders, no doubt, are on the front lines to supporting uh, all different kinds of communities across the five boroughs. And this is why we're so excited to be here with you today to think through trauma and mental health in the communities that you serve. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Reverend Dr. Wyatt, who has been leading this work in partnership with our office uh, to kick us off. Thank you. Well, sometimes that button, that unmute button doesn't work. I wanna thank each and every one of you, uh, given all that is going on on top of what has gone on, um, it seems that talking about trauma and talking about engaging uh, the interdenominational faith leaders uh, to address trauma and promote uh, mental health is right where we should be. As you heard, my name is Alfonso Wyatt um, and I am no stranger to interfaith work. I was uh, one of the creators of the Rabbi Marshall Meyer retreat series, the longest social action retreat series in the country, uh, perhaps even in the world, but I, I, I don't really know, but I'll just say in the country and definitely in New York City. Um, and this particular uh, workshop, this particular webinar rather, is really to help, uh, uh, help you support you are people from your congregation, from your from your, your faith tradition to help them uh, weather the storms that seemingly just keeps on coming. It is not a religious program per se. As I said, it's it 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 is about faith as it plays out as to how people uh, answer their call. So with that said, uh, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, to some and present to others our didactic leader, a psychotherapist, uh, a, a professor, uh, a husband, uh, a, a native New Yorker, uh, one who has uh, stood many winds. I met him during, well, he was my professor um, uh, at seminary, but I've also run into him with his work uh, after 9-11 a disaster expert in terms of uh, what to say, how to say it, how to teach it, how to reach it. I'm sure he has many audiences and we have been just happy, proud, and have been uh, taught a uh, great lesson. So without further ado, uh, we will go there. I will introduce our, uh, our panel. Um, after Dr. Ashley uh, presents. So without further ado, word or waiting, Dr. Willard Ashley. I am grateful and to Dr. Alfonso Wyatt for including me in this very important work. And enough cannot be said about Sophie and, and your professionalism and your client spirit and your willingness to collaborate with this crazy Black Baptist preacher. So, so, so thank, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to each and every one of you that did not count to robbery on a Friday afternoon to share in this webinar about a very important topic. Just as Dr. Wyatt said, I am a native New Yorker, born and raised, educated, good or bad, in the public school system of New York City, played on the basketball team of the Fashion Institute of Technology, and all those good things and maintain a, a, a residence, if you will, on Riverside Drive. So I'm, I'm one of us. I am one of us and I look forward to having a conversation that we can share, share together about a very important topic. And so on the next slide, we just wanna to begin to wrap our head around what is trauma? What is trauma? 
Uh, you look it up in the dictionary and you find out that it was a 17th century Greek word, which meant wound. And as a noun, it's deeply disturbing or distressing experience. And one could say that it is, it is emotional shock following a stressful event or physical injury. And in my particular context, it's called a bad church meeting, but that's another conversation for another day. And, and so it can be associated with physical shock and sometimes leads to long-term neuroses and post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we realized that if we're not careful, it will trigger a psychological, physiological response. It can be caused by exposure to racism, violence, economic insecurity, abuse, grief, and other negative life events. That's a mouthful, but that's the reality of what is trauma. And so in the next slide, we begin to take a look at trauma, psychological trauma causes damage to a person's mind due to one or more distressing events causing overwhelming amounts of stress. Yes, that exceed the person's ability to cope and can eventually can eventually lead to serious long term negative consequences. That's when you come to see somebody like me in the mental health profession to talk about it and to get some interventions. And so what are we talking about when we say this? And so next slide, we recognize that COVID-19 or the pandemic can produce other traumas. I mean, we're caregivers. Let's be truthful and honest. We're caregivers, no matter what titles you may have. At the end of the day, we are caregivers People turn to us in their moment and moments of need. And some of us on the weekends have to make sense out of this craziness and attach meaning to it and share it with the congregation or with other spiritual minded people. Or those just want to know, hey, is there any kind of does this make how does this make sense? Make make sense out of it. And 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 so I tell people that I bleed blue, but I'm not a crypt. But I love the New York Yankees and and I loved the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so for me, one of the ways of dealing with all of this stuff is finding times to relax. But before I get there, my congregation says to me that this pandemic has exposed us to racial trauma. And, and that when I see things about hate, fill in the blank, who's being hated this week or today? that it traumatizes us, that as a congregation, there's trauma because the people that a year ago were with us that because of COVID-19 have left us. And so we may begin to return to our physical location or we may not. And even engaging in that conversation, do we go back to the building? Do we stay online? Produces trauma for, for at least for the leadership, if not all involved. And Lord knows that as clergy or as caregivers that we face trauma on a regular basis. My heart goes out to those caregivers who've had to do eulogy after eulogy, who have had to sit with families and be there when they lost a loved one. And that we ourselves had to deal with our own trauma our own personal and family challenges, where if we if we receive COVID, did we get the vaccine, were we tested, et cetera. And clearly, as caregivers, you can't leave out the community because we don't offer care in a vacuum, but we offer care in a community or in communities, and those communities have been traumatized. And so in the next in the next slide, One of my mentors who became a close friend, I was honored to give her a eulogy at her home going. She was considered the mother of black psychiatry. She wrote a book entitled The Black Child back in the 70s, and it's still selling today. And so her approach was that there is nothing wrong with you. Wow, that was a radical departure from pathology. That there's nothing wrong with you, 
What has happened to you is wrong. Let's talk about it. So let's talk about what we've experienced as caregivers. What, what are the signs and symptoms of trauma? And you may not have all of these. You may have one or two of these, but let's talk about them. Trouble focusing. Feelings that interfere with daily life or become unmanageable. Feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. And I've heard caregiver after caregiver say in private moments, I feel hopeless and I have to figure this out because over the weekend I've got to be the, the carrier of hope. And I'm not feeling that right now. A loss of control. And that's very real. That's concrete. Loss of freedoms. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. You can go here. The movie theaters are closed. They're open. A building is open. They're not open. Offices are open. They're closed. So this loss of control. Increased anger and irritability. And we see that. We saw people fighting on air airplanes. We never have ever seen that happen before. We see people clearly are much more aggressive, if you will. And if you ask our family members, they may say, yeah, he or she's been irritable lately. And so we also find that there's times that we just avoid family and friends. We're not being antisocial, but we're just done. We, 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 there's no more left. Elvis left the building. There's nothing left for us to hold on to. And so I also find out that a sign is being hypervigilant or hypervigilance, if you will, and that we can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. I have embarrassingly suffered with this the majority of my adult life because I was raised in Harlem and I hear a car backfire and I jump. Because when I heard a car, what was supposed to be a car, now backfire was a gun. And you didn't know where, who was aiming at whom, and you ran for cover. And so fast forward decades later, that still, that still triggers something a response inside of me. To have persistent negative thoughts and mood changes. To have chronic stress. You can't tell me that if you are a native New Yorker or you're working in New York right now, you're caring for people in New York, that you don't experience constant chronic stress on a regular basis. And if I was in church to say, let the church say amen. And, and unhealthy eating. Oh my goodness. At the beginning of the pandemic, we put on, I do say we, my wife and I put on 10 pounds just like that because Oreo cookies didn't stand a chance. And then we made a decision to eat healthy, but that's coming up later. We'll talk about that later. And some folks misuse or use substances. We'll just leave it at that. This is a family program. <laughs> and so in the next I want to try. Somebody. Hey, Bob, could you turn off? Um, there you go. Okay. So then in the next in the next slide. How do we support people who have experienced trauma? Let me just give you the highlights. Then we're going to talk about each one in a little more detail. So we want to enhance the protective factors, use trauma informed practices and something that's hard for many of us to do care for yourself to support others we'll say a little bit more about each one of those so the first one enhance protective factors that means healthy habits all of us have some self-help books on our shelves somewhere or on our on our phones or our ipad but to actually do the things that are in those self-help books about creating and maintaining healthy habits, to have positive self-esteem, which includes, especially in New York City, a sense of identity, to be proud of who you are, to be your authentic self unapologetically, he said, to have problem solving and coping skills. And that's huge to be able to have skills to learn how to cope, sometimes with a moving target, but to learn how to cope, to have supportive relationships with friends, caregivers, and community. 
And sometimes, sometimes we're so busy caring for others and being super spiritual that we don't develop supportive relationships with folks who accept us as we are. I tell anyone that knows me, Willett Walden Christopher Ashley Sr. is certifiable. If you can handle that, we can be friends. If that disturbs you, then find somebody else because I own my craziness, can you? And so we need to be around people that are also other caregivers because we speak a language that's unique. I hope I'm in the right building. We have a conversation that others don't fully appreciate. We, we tend to be empaths, if you will. We feel other people's pain, which is what helps us to be traumatized because we just don't see it and throw it away. We feel it. And to have access to support services. We're going to say more about that as we continue this conversation. And to have spiritual and I say, and intellectual engagement, to do some reading, to do some research, to do some meditation, some praying, whatever you see as quote unquote spiritual. So that's the first, that's the first thing. Secondly, that after we enhance protective factors, we then take a look at the next slide. Which is to use trauma informed practices, which begins with to ensure physical and emotional safety. And let me make that concrete. Sometimes emotional safety is to turn off the talking heads at night or in the morning. Hello. We can only hear about partisan politics and all the other fights that take place, but so often without it having an impact on us. Amen, lights. And so we need to ensure our physical safety. We have to build social networks, particularly in a generational relationships. I may have a terminal degree and may have some advanced degrees, if you will. But I, I know that the six year old can do more of my cell phone and iPad than I could ever imagine. Am I in the right building? If you want to feel really stupid, hand your phone to a little kid and watch them say, you know, the phone does this, 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 and that. You go, really? Oh, my goodness. And they usually say, and you have a doctorate. Hmm, interesting. But that's a whole other conversation. And we strengthen social norms that encourage, that encourage healthy behaviors. Did I mention that before? My, 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 my friends and a few colleagues at Harvard Medical School encouraged me to use a program that allowed me to look at my weight and nutritional habits in a new light. And it worked. I lost 40 pounds. Amen. So you around people that encourage you to say, you know what? Will, you can't talk about self-care and you look like, yeah, okay, okay, don't, don't finish the sentence. I got, I got, I got, I got, I got it and to organize community collaboration and to share decision-making, to share decision-making, to offer opportunities for empowerment and skill building. I've been saying on, on, on these Zoom calls that all of us have officially now earned a PhD in Zoom. After a year or some months of dealing with Zoom, we've had the Zoom bombs, unfortunately. We've had the Zoom mishaps. We've had things go bad. We now are all experts in Zoom or Webinex or you, you, you figure it out, whatever you've been using, Microsoft Teams, you know, all those things. And to promote a sense of community belonging. We're, we, it is a we. We are in this together. And then the third, the third strategy if you will, that's on the next slide, suggest to us to care for yourself to support others. What does that mean? Breathe. Ah. Oh. To carve out five minutes or 10 minutes to meditate or pray. To ground yourself in the present moment. Yesterday happened, tomorrow we may have some anxiety, but stay in the present. And to acknowledge your concerns by making an art to engage your fears. I know I'm a psychoanalyst, you expect, expect me to say that, but I'm going to say it, yes. 
to acknowledge your fears. Someone said that smarter than me to make friends with your shadow. That's another long conversation for another day. Remember, most importantly, you are not alone. You are not alone to reach out for support. Did I mention to you, by the way, that you're not alone? Did I, did, I, did I forget to mention that? You're not alone. You don't have to do this by yourself. It's not a me, it's a we. And therefore, to create and sustain community. I am a total introvert. You may not believe it, but I'm, an, I'm very introverted. But I recognize if I plan to survive and I want to see my son hit 65 one day, it means I have to be around. And to do that, I can't be by myself. I have to reach out and create and sustain community. And to do that means to show up for one another, to listen compassionately, and to practice empathy. This could be my relative. This could be someone that I care about. How would I want them to be treated? Talk to me now. And as I said before, to unplug because sometimes it is just too much for our body, for our immune system to ingest. We just need a break from all of the craziness and the attacks, if you will, which means to avoid the media that sensationalizes emotions. Hmm, that's kind of an oxymoron, right? That's all they do, seems like, many times. So it means sometimes you have to avoid, avoid the, the media because, because it's again, it's just too much for us to take in. To stay healthy through, I know it sounds you know redundant, but stay healthy through regular sleep. I have one of those watches that can tell me how my sleep was, if it was good sleep, bad sleep, etc. And I keep, I pay close attention to that. And to diet or stay nutrition and to exercise. And you may not be able to swim around the pool 20 laps, etc. But even as we know, cardiologists tell us that walking can do can produce very good results. And I'm a Black Baptist preacher, pastor person. We say practice gratitude. Gratitude should be your attitude. Amen, lights. And so then finally, just just to recap, the takeaways are trauma is a natural stress response to a negative life event that can have short-term or long-term psychological effects. Faith leaders or caregivers can address trauma in communities by prioritizing physical and psychological safety, fostering social connections, and encouraging people to seek mental health support. It's okay not to be okay, but get some help, which means that you are not alone. Help, help, help is available. And thank you for your kind attention. I want to thank you for presentation. I want to thank all who are here. And so that we make uh, best use of our time, we want to uh, introduce our uh, panelists. And our panelists are, are giving of their information, of information, of their time, and in their concern. Uh, we talk about compassion, being able to feel the affirmity of others. Um, so with that said, I am going to ask uh, the, the panelists um, to, uh, to just say their name uh, and what you do, what you do to lower the trauma level in the community you are called to serve. That's not on any piece of paper, but that's going to be part of your introduction. And if there was one thing that this whole period or that life has taught you, because there was life before the pandemic, that life has taught you uh, in order to cope, in order to just get by, what is that one thing? So it's your name, where you do what you do, 
And uh, that last question about just what is trauma and something that you have learned in this period. So I'm going to start with Freddie. Freddie has been uh, with us on uh, several uh, uh, panels, so he knows the deal to get everybody uh, uh, just kind of, mm, we have, uh, and we'll go from there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Freddie Baez, and uh, I'm an uh, ordained minister. I'm also a psychotherapist and a supervisor at uh, Full Circle Health and New York Psychotherapy. And um, as far as um, addressing issues in the community of faith, because I have uh, people who come to psychotherapy who are involved in the religious community. So now we're talking about the engaging of psychology and theology. And what I find for me is, can I instill a sense of hope? And for me is that once you get someone engaged in hoping, we're talking about maybe. And once I can get you thinking about hope and maybe, we're really talking about engaging imagination. Can, can I help you imagine a different scenario? Can I help you imagine a different outcome? And I think that once people start engaging in the maybes, in the possibilities, I, I think they start, uh, and the fact that you're in the room with someone who's taking you seriously, someone who's listening, someone who values you, uh, all that adds up to people feeling that maybe this thing can change. You know, I'm engaging a different way of, of being. And I think the key word for me is flourishing. You know, when I hear that word flourishing is growth in all areas of my life. And um, can I imagine something different and it's interesting that the sacred literature of all all western uh, of the western uh, faith uh, islam judaism and christianity we have stories of of uh, characters in struggle against many forces against the odds and yet in spite of these odds they overcome in spite of these odds they manage to come to a place beyond survival to actually thriving so I think for me, that's that's vital and that's important. Beyond survival to thriving. And because I've read all of your bios, uh, I'm going to go to Dr. Ali. Uh, and I'm going to you because I saw in the slide something that I may have missed, making an art of engaging your fears. Now, I don't know if Brad wrote that. I don't know if Dr. Ashley wrote that, but that jumped out at me. And now I'm going to you. Please ident uh, identify yourself, Dr. Ali. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Ashley also for that wonderful presentation. I just I think that was just so fabulous. You covered so many things that are not only informed by what scholars know, but about what we know as human beings instinctively. And I feel like that is what is missing so much from scholarship, so much from the academic world is the instincts that we have as human beings about ourselves and each other. And I just think, I just think that was wonderful and beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you also, um, Sophie for having me and Dr. Wyatt also for inviting me. So grateful to be here. I'm Alicia Alley. I'm a psychology professor at New York University. I specialize in the mental health effects of racism, discrimination, trauma, and violence. Um, I've been a psychology professor for over 20 years now at NYU for the past 20. And before that, I was on faculty in Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. So I'm originally from Canada. So I've been so thrilled to consider myself a New Yorker for the past couple of decades and to just understand the interweaving of faith communities, of immigrants, of refugees, and just understanding 
how they are so much of the basis of how we define ourselves as New Yorkers. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I'm glad to be part of this discussion today. What I do in terms of helping people from my community and others, um, you know, as a professor, especially at NYU, we have so many international students, so many students who came here. I remember right after 9-11, students coming here from Muslim countries. And I realized that even as a psychologist, you know, I think, my instinct at first is to guide, advise, help, but a lot of the times all they want is for someone to just listen compassionately, to listen with an open heart. And the thing that I've found helps the, the, the most sometimes is simply to listen and to hold space for someone in their suffering and their pain. Being heard and truly listened to, I think can be so valuable for people who are experiencing trauma and just for, for all of us as, as human beings. Um, what, have, what have I learned? I think that was the other thing we we're supposed to comment on. You know, one thing that I've learned is the importance of being in community with people who are like you and people who are very not like you on the surface. Because in doing that is where we recognize our common humanity and reaching across difference and being in community with each other residing in different sorts of communities and being together in those ways, I think is something that I've learned not only over the past year, but just in my time and thinking about what helps when people are experiencing trauma. Thank you, thank you. And from Dr. Ali, I'm going to Dr. Banks. Um, if you would introduce yourself um, and uh, respond to the question. Yes, hi, thank you so much. And it's been uh, a pleasure. I always like being in the company of conversations where we're looking at overcoming and resiliency and considering the strength that is being human, our constant ability to adapt. And I, I am a clinical psychologist. I've used most of my superpowers in three ways. One in huge communities of practice of large Baptist churches of 20,000 members as a chief learning officer um, in terms of organizational development back in the days when I was at Pfizer as in uh, HR, I'm now a recovering HR person. So I'm now back as the senior vice president for the Child Center of New York uh, leading their organizational culture and talent development efforts. And one of the things that this entire year and a half have brought aligned uh, for me are in alignment with, I think, what Dr. Alfonso's questions ask us, right? The lessons learned about being human in this pivoting and constantly changing process where we've had to turn ourselves into the best of ourselves, even in times that were the worst for ourselves. And so when you talk about grit and resiliency, those are I believe the structures that keep us on one side of the trauma or another. Uh, the thing I remember when going through trauma and treating trauma is that you often use, use and lose language um, differently. And sometimes, you know, you read about it, right? When you're studying, it's like, what do you mean you can't talk about it? But you literally cannot. And so for those of us in the field and helping professions, one of the gifts that we got this year was learning a new way of communicating in Hollywood squares, uh, in silence, uh, often just sitting in each other's company from a distance. And so I, I think that's one of the gifts that we get to share and keep and remember in our practices, especially if we use the gift of space and time and silence in our recovery work that it is a supportive and binding. And then the other way that I would like to offer a reflection hold on. around hold uh, on. the process. Uh, Dr. Banks, hold on. Sure. If you're not talking, I'm going to ask that you keep yourself on mute. Um, okay, thank you. No, that's fine. I'm so used to talking over children and babies and noise, I just keep going. So thank you for that. Um, but I think the other, the other piece I'd like to share um, as we're all educators, right, and we're all being educated, is the process of learning has changed. And I think uh, we thought about it one way and we had to think about it another way. Uh, and I think not just learning as 
we know traditionally comes from our clients and our patients and our students and our family. But this time we had to learn about our own ability to be able to sustain and withstand an extreme amount of pain. And I've had the pleasure of working with the United Nations in the anti-racism spaces for gender equity this year. And it was a phenomenal truth that uh, we think that we're at capacity and then we learn that we're not. And it's because we can be in it together and it's because we can process it. So those were the two gifts that um, I believe these last 19 months have brought and I expect will continue to offer us in these spaces. Thank you. I'm now going to move over to my, my brother and my friend, Rabbi Kaplan, Rabbi Bob Kaplan of the same. Um, and Thank you very much, um, Reverend Wyatt. Um, Rabbi Bob Kaplan, I'm the, um, my job is the executive director of something called the Center for Community Leadership at the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. It's a sort of a long title. However, what I do on a daily basis, in a very different way now the past year or so uh, than I did before, is look to connect the various different communities around New York, look to find opportunities through various different initiatives and efforts and just being there. Um, diverse communities around New York in order for them to see a common vision, a notion of a shared society. And that's really the mission statement of what we do is, is having such a shared society. And the challenges of the past year, well, man, I want to tell you, it, every day there is something new, <clears throat> something perplexing, something so challenging that I have to really, um, I always kid around, I get up in the morning and I go through my morning time of angst of my own personal trauma. And then I got to figure out what to do with it and to figure out what to do, because the reality is, is the, the mantle that we've taken on as leaders, whether it's in a church, whether it's in an academic position, whether it's in a communal position, are pretty deep right now. And we don't have the opportunity to back off. We really don't have the opportunity to back off. Well, we do have the opportunity, but we've got the responsibility and the necessity not to back off. We could just, you know, step aside. So what have I learned this year? Well, well, this morning, somebody called me and we were talking about events happening about 10,000 miles from here in another part of the world that's deeply affecting many people in my community, many people in other communities here in New York because of the pain and the suffering and the horror and the tragedy and the death and the person said to me, I can't even begin to form a coherent thought. Can't even begin. And, and this is a person, by the way, where coherent thoughts are just sort of, you know, they're stock and trade. This is what they do. So I had to listen to that person. I had to be there with that person. I had to journey with that person through that pain and sorrow and inconceivability of where they were for themselves. Not for me, it wasn't about Bob, it wasn't about the work that I do, it wasn't about the coalition that I'm gonna build or it wasn't about the fellowship that we run, it wasn't about any of that stuff. It was being totally present. I heard this resonated in, in folks before, totally present for that human being at that moment and allowing them to journey through where they needed to be. And only, only when they were ready, only when they asked, was I able to give a word? Was I able to be there for them with a word, with a, with a context, with a little bit of what I call saging? You know, I'm getting a little bit old, I got the gray, gray beard now. So with a little bit of that saging that comes along with, with the journey that we're on, and, and, and the multiple life experiences or opportunities or 
challenges or freakouts or whatever you want to call it that have happened over these many, 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 many years that are brought into play in an intimate and powerful moment with one human being. And that is the lesson, that is the gift, and that is the blessing of, de of dealing with trauma. Now, that's on the individual level. Of course, we have the communal level as well. And there, um, trying my best as well. And then I got to try my best with myself. So um, mm. going back to what, uh, what uh, the Reverend said before, Reverend Ashley said before, when somebody says, hey, you look, you're talking about being peaceful. You're talking about creating uh, conflict resolution here or conflict prevention. You look tired. You look like you're in conflict. Well, that means I got to fix myself as I fix the world around me. So those are, those are just some of the stuff that's been going on. And it's been powerful. Been good. Been scary. But it's been powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Ashley, uh, I'll just, since you had opportunity to speak, um, is there a lesson? Is there something that you've learned in this period um, that you would want to share? Not to take myself too seriously. The work I do is serious, but I have faults and challenges just like anybody else. And not to leave my press clippings, I'm not as bad as they say, not as good as they say, somewhere in, somewhere in, 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 in between. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do, you know, being a pastor, psychoanalyst and professor, and people are like, oh my God, you know, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, or you're horrible, you're horrible. You know, it's extremes. But to realize that as a caregiver, we get sick. Some of us die, have died. And that to hold on to what's real. And for me, that has been family. We have a 11 pound, four year old Shih Tzu. And we say that we are her emotional support human beings. And she's been just wonderful to kind of keep us grounded. And I think out of that is to embrace and hold on to the stories. You know, I may forget all the little details of somebody's concept and somebody's theory and so forth, but the stories that people share, my story, their story, those things stay with us. That's why we turn on the television sometimes to watch the stories, so to speak, to hear about, we buy People's Magazine, TMZ, because we want to be embraced by the stories. And so during the pandemic, I have spent more attention than normal for me to really pay attention to the stories. As Pastor said, yes, there's stories of struggle, but there are also stories of searching, of suffering, of survival, of shame, and thank God, stories of strength. And so I try to embrace those stories and to, and to feed off of those. And I just say, you know, feed off the energy of those stories and to be present. But also know when to say, you know, I, I can't take the story anymore. I need to break from your story and my story and therefore, you know, shut it down. Thank you. What a what an appropriate way to do our transition to uh, my sister, uh, Tasnia Ahmed. Take yourself off mute. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. And I um, feel so lucky and blessed to be joined by such vibrant panelists and such vibrant uh, voices this afternoon. Uh, my name is Tasnia Ahmed. I am a social worker um, and I'm the domestic violence program director at Turning Point for Women and Families. Um, we are a New York based um, organization, nonprofit community based organization that serves survivors of domestic violence in the Muslim community. Um, and we've been around since about 2004, and we provide support services, including counseling, support groups, crisis intervention, um, and advocacy for survivors that um, come to us. For many of the women that we serve, this is the first place they come to, um, to talk about personal challenges, to talk about relationships, um, to talk about the fact that they need help, to ask for help. 
Um, and I want to echo what some of um, the other panelists mentioned, you know, sometimes the most valuable thing that we can offer is to hold space, is to say, it's okay to, to ask for help. It's okay to say, I, I need support, you know, um, and, and for some people, they need a space to be able to say that and to feel heard um, and to feel, you know, understood. And so I am um, very blessed to be in that position to, to be able to offer that. Um, and I think one thing that this pandemic has really taught me um, is the need to, you know, that it's so important to unplug, as Dr. Ashley mentioned, to unplug, to regroup, to take pause. Um, and the same way that we tell the folks that we, that we um, provide care to, you know, do that for yourself, to unplug, to pause, you know, I think this year has taught me that I, I need to embrace that myself. And so um, I think that's been a really um, important lesson <laughs> that I've learned this year is sometimes just to, to take that pause. And I hope that you're all doing the same when that's needed. All right, I'm going to go to my lightning round. This is a question. It's not a long elaboration. Uh, and you'll, you'll see why once you hear the question. And I want to tell uh, the family that's on the line that uh, there'll be opportunity for uh, either a general question or a focused question. And all of our panelists may not have to respond, not have to, but may not respond, but we want to try and get as many out as possible. I want to stay your friend, but if I need to push you a little bit uh, virtually, I will do that, but I'm doing it in love. The question that I have on the lightning round for this elite group of, 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 of panelists, of presenters par excellence. Mm. Somebody, let's get a little reaction there. Let me give a, a reaction to, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm feeling for all of our panelists. Thank you, Sally. Uh, you're the only one that joined me in, on this on this charrette here. Uh, yeah. Here's the question. Hmm. We talk about making space for others. We talk about a safe space. I want you to think about a time, not just a pandemic time. There were clocks before the pandemic. I want you to think about a time that someone asked you a question that helped you make space for yourself. Now I'm gonna give you a minute to think because you may have to travel somewhere. You may have to go somewhere. I'm not asking you to go to the depths of the question, but I believe that what you have to say will be important because many times it's hard to ask ourselves hard questions, okay? So with that said, I have no particular order. So if you feel so moved and so led, just light up your little spot there and take yourself off mute, hit it, and then I'm going to move to questions. Uh, Dr. Ali, I saw you. Go. I love this question because I feel like it just reminds you of moments, sometimes the most painful moments, like, oh, gosh, I remember when I lost my and someone had to ask me a question for me to remember myself. And I think it was probably one of those moments where I was choosing to, to make a decision and act out of fear instead of out of love, like self-love. And I was feeling like the smallest person in the room and no one's listening to me. Are they going to listen to a brown girl when I'm in the room of, of white men and my credentials are the same as theirs, but they're not seeing credentials. They're seeing someone small and brown and female. And, and someone who was refilling the coffee, the one person who saw me was a woman of color refilling the co coffee. And she came over to me at the break and she said, do you have kids? I said, yeah, I have two daughters. She said, be who your daughters want you to be. Who do your daughters want you to be? And the question was that. Who, who would your daughters want you to be right now in this moment? And because of that woman asking that question, I found my voice in that moment. I owe her so much. I don't even know who that woman was. But when you asked that question, that's the moment I thought of. 
Next, uh, let's go with uh, you, uh, Dr. Banks. Take yourself off mute. I've been thinking about that question and I have to say the biggest lesson was in capacity. And that's where I think I landed there. I would say there is no end. There's no bottom. It's a perception. It's what I call a silent agreement. And the love that was required for me, for myself, was to let go of those silent agreements that came, you know, telling you you can't do it or stories from the past, narratives that we construct to defend against fear and pain and to let my capacity extend internally because oh, that was the one place that had more space than I could ever fill. All right. I'm going to go over to Rabbi Kaplan. Sure. Um, I had a teacher once, uh, what we call Rebbe, um, a spiritual teacher. When I first started my Jewish journey, um, he was a very simple man. I mean, the, the one thing he liked to do more than anything else was play hold that tiger on his little Casio. Um, yet he was one of the most profound people I ever met. Matter of fact, the head of the yeshiva was considered one of the greatest mystics of the age. Um, he chose him to write down his thoughts and interpret them for the the world. Uh, there's a whole series of books uh, that he's uh, responsible for. One day we were walking down the street and he turns to me and uh, my Hebrew name is Ruvain. So he turns to me with this meek little voice and I can just hear it in my head. Reb Ruvain, Reb Ruvain, tell me. It says in the Talmud that the, and this is particularly powerful moment uh, to talk about this, it says in the Talmud that the atmosphere, the air of Jerusalem makes you wise. Why are there so many stupid people there doing so many stupid things? And I turned to him and I thought for a moment, I said, well, I guess they just don't know how to breathe. And his smile came on his face. He goes, very good, Reb Ruvay. Very good. And I've been chewing on that for the past, wow, 30, 35 years now. On um, when I, uh, it's just this blessing around all the time. It's just, this stuff happened all the time. I'm just too busy to see it. I'm too busy to, to know it. I'm too busy to breathe it. And I got to breathe it. All right. So I got to slow down sometimes to breathe that wisdom so that I can not be the stupid person that's ignoring it. Thank you so much. And I could see why he smiled. All right, well, I'm gonna move on to Dr. Ashley. The same question, I'm gonna put a little turbo on it because I wanna to get to questions and begin formulating questions. You can either put it in the chat and Sophie will, 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 will find you or you can uh, do a little reaction thing and raise your hand and we'll try and call on you. We're gonna get as many out as possible. All right, and your questions can be from what you heard, what you saw, and what you're feeling, uh, and we'll do the best that we can go from there. Dr. Ashley. This is an easy one. An institution basically said, you know, you're not good enough for us any longer after a change of administration. And I almost drank the Kool-Aid for a hot second. And then God just sent so many other prestigious world global institutions say hey can you teach a course for us can you do a lecture for us can you write can you write a chapter for us can you do a journal article and at some point i said okay god i get it and i can move on now and and, and let it go in that regard all right thank you uh sister ahmed sure um that's it's an easy one for me as well i have to say um you know during during this pandemic um i think that uh, you know, to reiterate what's said before, being in community was such a vital part of the healing and part of coping. Um, and I have I have one coworker, I don't know if she's on watching today, but um, I have one coworker who set up um, every few weeks would set up these writing circles um, for us. And it was a space where um, it was really, it was really nice to not be asking the questions, but to be asked, 
you know, and to be prompted to reflect on yourself, you know, and so I am grateful. And I think that was, you know, one of the opportunities throughout this year that I've been able to hold space for myself and have been have learned the importance of that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Hi, I think for me, it's it's the silence. Um, I graduated in 1989 from Fordham University. And as a young clinician, I remember being in a room with a family, a religious family, who actually lost a, a five-year-old drowning in an accident in a family pool. And so here I have a parent raging and, and yelling at God and, you know, with the whys and what can you say? And and I remember the times in my life when I had why questions. And it was the first time I realized that all this training, all this preparation, and you're in this room and not a word to say. And then I, it, what came to mind was Job's friends and just to be present. And sometimes that's all you can do, just to be present. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for allowing space for that question. And part of what I want everybody in all of the boxes, whether we can see you or whether you have a standard uh, image, I want you to know that we're all just human beings. Um, we may have training, we may have opportunities, we may have money in the bank or no money in the bank. It does not matter who we are, but we're human beings going through life, going through these experiences, making space for others and others making space for ourselves. So I, I think that that is a, a good a place to land as it relates to opening up for questions. And I see some of my colleagues out there, Carol Tyrell, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, all that you do all over this great state. Uh, so with that said, <laughs> questions, um, let's get them up. Sophie, do you have one um, in the chat box? No? I all don't. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, I do. I'm sorry about that. Um, question for the group. How do you as providers address traumatic events like mass shootings and genocides when they happen suddenly or are prolonged in your sermons? So how do you address these events in your sermons? Could you ask it again? I was looking for the question. <laughs> it was sent to me directly. Um, oh, okay. How do you, as providers, address traumatic events like mass shootings and genocide in your sermons? Anybody? Well, I think one one thing is I do I do address it, so I don't I don't avoid it, and I, I make sure that we very careful to pray for the families that have been on on both sides of it both victim and those who are responsible for creating creating the situation and we said it's part of the curriculum of life and and how do we find ways to address it and at the same time to find still find hope and is there any way that we can be part of the solution if that's possible i make sure that we don't have any because we would say in my tradition any bad theology that we start pointing fingers at people and demonizing folks or commu whole communities, that we, we universalize it as best possible, try to find hope, try to give some meaning, try, try, try to be as factual as possible about the actual event itself, and then say, but here's where the hope lies, here's where the challenge to make a difference takes place. I remember I was called upon to do um, a eulogy for a nine-year-old. Um, excuse me, um, she was 14. Uh, she was in junior high school. And she was traveling on a city bus and she was shot uh, on that bus. This was probably in the early 2000s. And all of her students uh, from her school was there. And the service was held at uh, at my particular house of worship. It is also a large church and the whole community was there. Um, 
And I felt that I had to speak to the young people and, and, and try to make some, not so much sense, but context. And to create space, we didn't use that term then, but to create space inside of them to move beyond the tragedy of the moment because her coffin was right there. It was open. 50 Cent paid for that coffin and paid for the whole funeral. And that's another story. So confronting, you're, you're right, Dr. Ashley, confronting is, is spot on with, with compassion. With compassion. Mm, 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 I'm getting excited. All right, somebody else, a question, comment, thought. I can't see the back screen. Who's on on number two? I'm gonna. I don't know if anybody's raising their hand. You can see all of the screens, right, uh, Sophie? Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, I'm Minister Dale Smith from Staten Island, New York. Here with Dr. Carol, representing Dr. Caroline from First of Baptist in Staten Island. So I'm first gonna say, God bless everybody on the on the panel. I also want to say, to your talk as far as gun shooting, I work with a uh, anti-gun violence program, Cure Violence Through Life. Whereas as far as shooting responses, we're talking about, we know it's a hard problem. People don't have a heart sometimes for God. Not putting people down, but speaking to that and asking people that have an understanding that are accountable to God to go out and unpack the gospel to give people hope. So that's how we handle the sermons, make the sermon a lot, make the sermon live. So it's one thing to preach it actually inside the walls, but taking it outside the walls of the church and preaching it to the people and in a way that's, that's simplistic enough for them to understand. So that's how we handle it here. Presbyterian Baptist Church in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wyatt has been, been to our church here a couple of times, so you know he knows as well. So we're, the work, we're working, that. that's how we're working it right now. Please uh, tell Dr. Carolina I said hello. I will do, Dr. Is there another question in the house or anybody else? Uh, I, I just want to respond to that one a little bit. Um, certainly lifting up what uh, Reverend Ashley said as well. Uh, one of the reasons that he and I are friends because we, we, we certainly think in very similar terminologies. The one thing I try to do whenever I'm encountering anything that is beyond, because genocide or any of the issues that you just described like a, an ultimate crisis, and ultimate crises come in many, many different packages, by the way, many, many different packages. They're not just a 9-11 package. They're not just, you know, the Rwandan package or the Holocaust package. They come in many different packages. I try not to speak in the voice of God, but as the connection to God. Allowing people to connect to the creator as best they can at the moment. And I got to repeat that as best they can at the moment. Because in that moment, they may be angry at God. In that moment, they may be not able to even hear a word. But just create the conduit mm. and be there as the conduit. Because too many folks, they just want to be the voice of God rather than the partner with our mm. creator. Wow. Wow. And please... In 1996, uh, my nephew, my oldest sister's son, uh, a junior at Morehouse, died in a car accident. And it was, it was beyond traumatic. That word doesn't even capture. And I knew people were uncomfortable. And and sometimes when you are the, uh, the person that is trying to bring comfort, you are uncomfortable in your comfort role. I found that just a look could be therapeutic. I also saw that sometimes people said things that I think made them feel better about my pain. And generally those were the comments that I was like, it was like, remember nails on a blackboard? 
I don't, I don't really need you to tell me that God needed a flower and plucked a flower and put it in the heaven, heaven's garden. There is no perfect word. Sometimes it's a touch. Sometimes it's a look. And sometimes it's just the word that, and I think Bobby said it, show up the best way you can. Okay, okay, that, that, that was a, a question. Somebody else. If you'd prefer to share a question privately, you can send it to me directly in the chat and I can lift it up anonymously. Dr. Ali? Can I, can I, I just want to reflect on so many of things that you just said, Dr. Ashley, I thought were so powerful. And one was that need for us to remind ourselves not to vilify the, another community or, bl or blame another community we can look outward without looking outwards in blame or pointing fingers. And I think that when something tragic happens, I find especially with young people that it's helpful for them to rem remember the power of activism and of coming together. And so often people will characterize those who work as activists as, as working out of anger, out of anger against something. And when we saw last year, so many young people coming together, they were coming together out of need for a community. They were feeling isolated. They wanted to know that they were not alone in their suffering and their pain. And they wanted to be with others just to be with them and know that they were not alone in that. And I think, I think that is so important. We think about over the past year, a lot of people have turned back to the faith that they had been raised on, but had not even really thought about. They thought they didn't need it anymore. But we find that there are things that crisis does and a crisis will show us the best and the worst all in a very heightened, elevated way. And seeing that connection that happens through so many ways and activism is one of them is part of that reaching out and part of what faith can mean to so many people in so many different ways. Hmm, thank you. Anybody else? I don't want to cut anybody off. Well, here's a question. And it's one that has come up on several of our webinars. How would you present to a person who may have uh, uh, issues that are beyond the, the ability of the person hearing the issue to successfully address. How would you tell someone um, that they need help, that they, they, they need to see somebody, you know, that euphemistic somebody? Uh, how would you frame that in a way that it can be heard, filtered through your various traditions. I think it's important that each of us use our own personality and temperament, that there's some things I can get away with that some of the others could never get away with and some things they can and I cannot. And so people that, that trust me enough to engage in a conversation know that I may say some things that, that are lighthearted but are very serious in, in the end. And so this past several months, I've had more people that supposedly have hesitancy towards going for psychotherapy and mental health uh, and interventions to come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I know you're a psychoanalyst, you're a group therapist person, so I go to therapy. And if it's a quote unquote BIPOC, black indigenous person of color, I will say, absolutely. And they'll say, give me one reason. And I'll say, you're a black person in America. That's all you need to know. And they go, what time do you have available? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I agree. Think, I think, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, so, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just speak very brief. I think on that same piece, I'm always thinking that the minute you notice that there's something happening in yourself that's leaving you in discontent, that's pulling at the holes of your understanding, it's such a gift. It's such an awakening. Um, even being able to feel depressed, even being able to feel anger because of the numbing that tends to come with the trauma. 
And so once that celebration of feeling and emotion is there, I'm often encouraging them to say, this is such a curious place you're in. Why don't we discover what else lies beneath together? And even if that's getting you to another source. So I just think anytime we can feel alive, it's a way to support our mental health. Thank you. Is that mad? Yeah, I, I also think that it's important for us, each each of us um, as providers, you know, in, in whatever capacity that may be as caregivers, you know, we have to recognize what our um, limits are in terms of our knowledge as well. And so when we encounter someone who needs support that maybe we are not trained to give or maybe we are not experts in giving to say, you know, this is this is my limit and let me help connect you to someone who can support you in the best way possible? You know, let me help. Um, let me let me help you find the right people for this, and I can be with you in that search. You know, you're not alone in, in discovering that. I think that it's a very powerful thing to say. I, I want to lift up what uh, Tazi just talked about um, in a very important way. Is the only way you're going to help somebody is having a little bit of self knowledge you're going to have to realize what you, what you don't realize. you got to be willing to say, maybe I can't help this person. Maybe it's beyond me. Maybe it's beyond my skills. And I, I come to that one a lot because um, it's something that uh, I have to encounter all the time when I see that there are things that the person needs that I, as a human being, as a professional, simply can't provide them. And sometimes it, it takes leading them to say what they need and then saying to them, you know, you know, you're going to have to do that. You know, you're going to have to go there, you know? And it's like, uh, like Reverend Ashley said, sometimes I get away with what I get away with because who I am, how I operate. Um, and they just look at you and, and they go, no, no, no. So, well, okay. But you know, you have to go there. Mm. You know, you have to confront this in yourself. And, but you got to do it with absolute and perfect love. No condemnation, no judgment, just perfect love. Mm. And that's a hard place to be. It is a hard place to be. I want you to think on, um, on this in terms of this thought. Most of the people, and I don't know all of them, but I know many of them, uh, are givers. And every day there are demands. I, I call it un, unwanted demands uh, of, of, of spiritual energy. Um, some of us have become bankrupt in, in, in our spirit. Uh, our spirit tanks are... Uh, have just had so many unwanted demands on energy. I want you to think about this, and I'm going to uh, ask each one of you to uh, just give a reflection. Mm. Why is it so, I don't want to leave with the question, why, why is it difficult at times to get people who give out to others to give to themselves. And if you find that so, respond. And if you don't, you don't have to respond. Or you could say, Bonzo, you're off on that. <laughs> well, I, I want to say that um, often when I train uh, new therapists, I often tell them, uh, people who just graduated, I tell them it's going to take five years for you to get out of the room so you can really listen to the story. So it takes about five years for you to get out of the way because your ego and your good intentions get in the way of really being in the room with someone. And once you kind of take that focus off of yourself in terms of being the answer, being successful, then I think you can begin to hear people. And, and so I think we need to get out of the way, which means I, I need to be honest with my limits. Okay. I think that a lot of 
a lot of the fear that people have is that you're not going to be able to help others if you spend too much time looking at your own pain because that's going to get in the way of you being useful to someone else. And I think if we sort of subvert that idea and say, if you remember times where you felt lost and where you felt pain, that can help you connect to that other person's pain um, and, be, and be there. But also, you know, I do a lot of work, um, you know, group psychotherapy um, with veterans. I study a program for especially a lot of um, very poor military veterans of color. And they, are, they have been trained in their families of origins and through their military service and training to not show signs of weakness. And we train them to work providing help to other veterans, um, you know, basically mental health support. And the, the, the very interesting thing is that the things that they've seen and done and lived through, which would terrify most people, sometimes they say the scariest thing is to admit to a fellow veteran that they've been scared, that they have felt pain. And I feel that so much of our conditioning, if you're, if you're a woman and you are a mother or a grandmother, you need to be strong because you have to be there for other people in your community. If you're, if you're a man and you're the provider, you can't show that weakness. So you know, veterans are a, a particular example of that. But I think there's a lesson for us all that if we don't look and acknowledge our own pain, then at some point it's going to prevent us from giving to those who we want to give to the most. And I think that's it's essential for people who are professional caregivers, but just for those of us who want to be there for other people in our communities. Dr. Wyatt, you and I were in class together some time ago, and we, we spoke to this issue, and we were just going around the classroom asking for people to kind of introduce themselves. And one of your, one of your classmates said, oh, my name is, I said, whoa, 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 time out, time out. We can all hoop. We can all do the Baptist, Baptocostal thing. I don't need that. Tell me how your mother, your father, your relatives talk to you, talk in a normal tone. Too many of us have issues that we've not resolved with our self-identity. Be it racialized, be it titles. You talk to a lot of different folks and you ask who they are, they lead with their title. That's an issue. I'm saying as a psychoanalyst, that's an issue. You're more than a title. Just the same way you're more than an illness. You're more than a DSM-5 category. Hello? And so too often people get stuck in the titles and in the categories and they can't relate as a break, as I said earlier, as others said, as a human being. That's my title. I'm a human being. I'm the child of Will and Clara Ashley. And we get stuck on that. And so sometimes folks get so caught in their title that when they lose it, they also lose their sense of identity and the will to live. Because I am no longer so-and-so. Well, hopefully you have a plan B and C. And if you lose that title, you may have a different career, but you still have a work to do. So again, I want to lift up uh, what Reverend Ashley uh, just talked about. You know, the models of leadership that we've been fed, um, and we're all we all have that unconscious bias. You know, that that stuff built into us, and and how we see things. If the models that we've been fed doesn't allow for it, um, uh, Doctor King, um, I was on my way to Australia once. When you travel to Australia, you got to watch a lot of movies on the plane. So I ran out of movies and I went to the documentaries and there was an HBO special on the last three years of Dr. King's life. Well, we don't, too, not too many people know the mental anguish, the, 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 the space that he went into for those three years. And I watched this and you know, I sort of knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know the depth and it blew my mind. And then when he started coming out of it, because he couldn't go see a therapist because you know, he was afraid of J. Edgar Hoover and all that jazz, which is probably very real. Um, one of him, one of his folks, I think it was um, Jesse Jackson said to him, so what happened? He says, I'm not afraid anymore. Hmm. 
Whoa. So, and, and, and that's what he said right before he died. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid of me, let alone the world out there. I'm not afraid of me and who I am. I'm willing to look at myself in full picture. Well, that was one of the best leadership lessons I ever got sitting on that plane flying to, uh, to Australia from a teacher that I've learned so much from, but had no idea that would be a lesson that I would get because that was human. As, as Dr. Ashley said, that was a human being talking, not the great Dr. King, not the leader of the civil rights movement, not the, the icon that we, we always end under, all the quotes that we get. That was the human being facing up to who and what he was, and he was ready to take the next steps. Unfortunately, there were people in the world that didn't want him to continue walking, and uh, that happens too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else before I hand it over to, to, to Sophie? Yes, can I ask something to Professor Freddie Baez? This is Reverend Omar Chakwezi, ATS alumni. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> um, right. Dr. Wyatt asked a similar question I was going to ask. And last time you were the first to answer, I said, wow, God is working. <laughs> um, we as caregivers, we are custom giving out and pouring into everyone else. How do we know when is that time to slow down and say, okay, I have to recharge my batteries here because as the saying goes, if you don't take time to take care of yourself, you're no good to anyone else. <laughs> so how do we know that fine point of saying, okay, you know what? I need some help here. Let me slow down and back off from the caregiver role and try to take care of things by God's grace, you know, to um, right. better myself. How, what, where's that fine point? All right. Uh, I was thinking that was the question I was asking. So thank you for refining it. Hit it, Freddie. Okay, I'm going to say we're all wounded healers. And I'm going to say that the first thing we need to recognize is um, the people who walk with us, our family members, our friends, they're the first ones to notice when something's not right, because they know us, they know our patterns. So I'm going to say that a lot of times if, we, if we're not honest with ourselves, honest enough to recognize our limits, the people around us, the people closest to us begin to see things and begin to give us feedback. So I'm going to say that that's, that's part of it. Anybody else? If I could just add to that, um, I think that you know, taking time for for ourselves as caregivers, that should be a part, that should be a part of our daily routine. If you get to a point where you're realizing you're hitting your limits, you've waited, you waited too long to take care of yourself. And so make it a habit, make it a practice, give yourself, if, if you need quiet time, or if you need to be with loved ones, if you, whatever it is that brings you, that fills your cup, do it every day because your cup, you deserve to have a full cup every day, guys. So don't wait till you feel it, just do it. I love that. Fill your cup up, fill it up till it overflows. Fill it up so that you will have something in the cup to give to somebody else and not just an empty cup. Empty cup can happen, can, can work these days. Um, there is a question, uh, any guidance for families who have become estranged do uh, from the from the impact of traumatic events over the past year. Come on, Professor. Let's 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 come on now. We are, we are at the end of the clock. Sometimes miracles don't happen overnight. We have to have patience. We can do a whole bunch of biblical examples of that in in, in different different sacred literature. And sometimes you just have to mark time in, until the until the miracle happens. Yeah, I'm gonna say I think uh, Joseph waited 15 years or something, or maybe even a little bit more before his brothers come back into his life. So he can't rush the healing process. And family, there's no drama like family drama. Our family drama creates trauma. And sometimes trauma or troubles expose the fissures of 
the places that we may have smoothed over or uh, we avoid or we sweep it under the rug until we start tripping over the rug. In October, usually therapists are busy. People are talking about having to go visit family Thanksgiving. Then they come back from Thanksgiving, have to talk, have to process, you know, oh my God, you know, my sister, my brother is still crazy. They still get on my last nerve. I still can't believe they treat me like a little kid. Yada, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. My stint at the Ackerman Institute, um, we talked about making the covert over and finding ways to take subtextual uh, issues un that's under the table or those uh, unspoken agreements that my, my, my dear sister talked about, Dr. Banks and Leah Banks. We got to get this stuff out um, and, 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 and not out to wound, but to begin the healing process. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for the work that you do. Um, I'm talking about everybody in every one of the squares uh, that, that, that's here, um, 40 of you, um, that you make a difference. Take care of your light. I want to end with this. Uh, when I was in, uh, in the 80s, when I was trying to find my authentic self, I was visited by the muse of poetry. I never wrote poetry, didn't want to write poetry, but I would wake up every morning. Uh, Dr. Ali, I know you use creativity in your work. Uh, so I want to offer this to you and then turn it over to our dear sister Sophie. The title is The Enlightenment. Children of the light, heed this urgent call. Use thy power over darkness. Stumble, never fall. Illume dark corners in all hearts and minds. Share this precious flame, the tide that binds. Hatred is your enemy and ignorance another foe. So band together small flames wherever you may go. There is strength and number. And remember, you are light. And every flicker is a wound to darkness. This our eternal fight. Thank you. I love you. Peace be unto you. Keep that light on. Protect that light. Thank you for that hand, Freddie. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sally, for the thumbs up. Thank you for the heart. Mm, mm, mm. So with that said, I do a bounce pad. Whoop, what sports metaphor found its way in here again. I do a bounce pass to our point guard uh, uh, over here, Sophie Pauls. And I want you to know that this sister, there's always the worker bees. Uh, if you don't have worker bees working with you, then that means you got to do everything. And she is a worker bee. And she has organized all five of these webinars, uh, onboarded uh, the panelists. Uh, she is just fabulous. I just met her through this endeavor, but I know that's my little sister over there. And 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 uh, this is what it's all about, just making family. So with that said, my dear, thank you. Your call. Thank you. Um, this was a tough act to, to close, I have to say. Um, today's discussion was incredibly rich, and I um, I think I learned a lot today that I hope to, to bring to, to the work that I do. So thank you. Um, and, and, you know, in response to Reverend Dr. Wyatt's comments, I'm going to miss you all. <laughs> um, I've been working with, with a group of you since early April, even before, and, and we've had some familiar faces in these webinars. And so thank you to all of you for continuing to join. I want to close today just to emphasize that we have a number of mental health resources available for all New Yorkers. They are free. Uh, they are available regardless of citizenship or insurance status. We have resources that are tailored to children and young people, to veterans, to older adults, and everyone in between. I, on Monday, will follow up to make sure that everyone who registered for today has access to those resources, in addition to a toolkit for faith leaders that was co-authored by Reverend Dr. Wyatt and a trauma support guide that provides some additional guidance and distills some of what we heard today. 
So with that, you will hear from me on Monday. And thank you so much. Enjoy the wonderful weekend. Um, and congratulations to all of the panelists today. You were amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Stay strong. Hey, Belinda. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I had to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> I love the series. Thank you, Sophie. Wonderful series. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Bye.